shit to create, we stepping up to the plate Go, go, can't be late, start to tell, we bout to excel Tell them pick up the pace, we are just here to create We stepping up to the plate, go, go, can't be late Start to tell, we bout to excel Tell them pick up the pace Kia ora and welcome back to another episode of Pick Up The Pace Podcast. Today we have one of the greatest rugby players of all time on our show. He has played 48 games for the All Blacks, including 22 tests. He won a Rugby World Cup in 1987 and during his captaincy from 87 to 1990, the All Blacks did not lose a single game. Nō Ngāti Tūwhare Tōa Tōku Hoa nei, Nō Ngāti Raukawa Nō Raukawa Ki Whare Pūhunga Ahau, Engari Nō Ngāpui Tōku Hoa Wahine, O Ti Rā Ko Enei, Ngā Hononga, Wayne, Kamoya Tom, Tame George Shelford, Ia Media Shelford Kaputa, Kolezi Kingi. Te Tupuna Fire o Toku Hoa Wahine, Me Tokoro, Iruera George Tamati Shelford. Kamoya Lezi Kingi, Ia Henare Kingi, Kaputa, Ko Henare Kingi. Te Koro o Toku Hoa Wahine. Kamoya Henare Kingi, Ia Margaret Rose Paki, Kaputa, Ko Tu Fakariri Ka Kingi, Te Papa o Toku Hoa Wahine. Kamoya Iruera George Tamati Shelford, Ya Emi Arena Shelford Kaputa, Ko Nathan Shelford Tō Papa, Kamoya Nathan Ia Mavis A, Kaputa Mai Ko Kuewain. Nō reira i te rangatira o te whare tapu o ngā puhi te uri o rahiri o uenuku o kaharau waiho i whiria te paiaka o te riri te kawa o rahiri ngā puhi ko whaorau, nau mai, hara mai, ki tō mātou Pick Up The Pace podcast, Wayne Buck Shelford. <laughs> yeah, kia ora koro. Yeah. Kia ora, bro. How's everything been going there, Wayne, and uh, with the lockdown and you've been occupied and things? Oh, well, lockdown, I worked right through. Um, I've got a business down the road and uh, it's a big brand new car wash. It's only been open about seven months. And I worked all the way through just keeping the place tidy, but uh, working on the land block, I've got them behind it. So clearing, clearing the riverway out and cutting down gorse and piling it all ready to burn it in the middle of winter. All those sorts of things, but kept me busy, that's for sure. Nice one, but, nice you know, one. we're back back in the throes of uh, work now, and uh, you know, it's not like it was before we went to COVID, went under COVID, and um, so we're probably back to about oh, probably forty percent of what we were doing beforehand. But it'll come back. It'll come back. You know, people's pennies are a bit tighter today than what they were a few months ago, and uh, you know, some people are probably finding the pitch right now. Yeah, hundred percent. Mm. Hey, let's kick off the podcast here, Wayne, and um, let's just start with your whanau. So your mum, Mavis, and your dad, Nathan, can you tell us a bit more about how they inspired you and the important values that they passed on to you and your brothers, Brett, Dean, and Daryl, while growing up in Aotearoa? Well, <clears throat> we go back to my, my dad's side, you know, um, uh, I think they were all very much a, a sporting family, and uh, I've, uh, I, we had a bit of a small reunion last year with a few of our Two of the cousins in the direct line from from our grandmother and our grandfather. The first uh, we're from the first family because there's another family afterwards as well. And so um, basically, we we went up north and we started talking about our parents. And we needed to because I grew up in Rotorua. I didn't grow up with all my cousins. And uh, and basically, okay, it's not a big family, but uh, notwithstanding that, uh, we're all over the mutu nowadays and. Uh, living in Australia, over the big family over there, Hawaii, and, uh, you know, Rotorua. And, um, well, you know, um, a lot of the cousins now are living, you know, just everywhere. And so getting them all together has been pretty hard. But uh, we had this little uh, get-together, and uh, one of the big things we tried to do is find out stories about our uncles and aunties that we didn't know because we didn't grow up with them, you see. And that was an awesome experience, and some of the stories are absolutely brilliant, you know. Because they, they told me stories about my old man I didn't even know. You know? So, but notwithstanding that, my dad grew up in a family of, uh, I've got them upstairs, five sisters and five brothers. There was a couple of peepees that passed away young. So, um, you know, five, five and five. And uh, they're all gone. Uh, we've got one left. One left and she lives in, in Alice Springs and she's uh, coming up 85, I think, 86. Something like that. And she, she lives well over there because it's nice and dry. And the thing is, as soon as you come back to New Zealand, she gets sick, you know. And this is one of those things. So our auntie over there, she's very healthy, you know, for her age. And she's sprightly and she still talks. We talk to her on the phone all the time. But um, her and her clan are over there. There's about 60 of them over there. And so it's a big clan over there in, the, in Alice Springs. 
Um, but talking to some of the cousins, you know, what went on up north is that all the brothers were into sport in a big way. And I, I went and spoke up in, uh, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, with Mangakaya Rugby Club at their prize giving. And my, my father was in one of the photos along with my uncle, one of my uncles. It was taken in 1949. And so they did actually play rugby back in those days, so we found out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they were into that. They were, they were musicians. Their father had their own band. And, uh, well, more so, like, what would you call it? Uh, like, very much like the old saxes and the trumpets and, and not so much probably the drums, but guitars and all that sort of stuff and steels. They had a, a family group like that, so they're musical, very musical family. I think most Māori families were, weren't they, back in the day? 100%. And uh, my, my dad played rugby league as a young man as well, uh, all those sorts of things. But he left home pretty early, and uh, I think he didn't get on with his old, his old man. So he left, left really early. He was part of J-Force, Second World War, cleaning up over there, and um, came back to New Zealand. He became a an apprentice, a carpenter, and he qualified as a carpenter and then ended up in Rotorua meeting my mum. And my mum was just on a hiding with her mum and uh, her, her sister, younger sister. And that's where they met in Rotorua. And uh, she never, she didn't go back home with them, with, with her mother and her sister. She ended up staying, staying uh, up here in Rotorua and uh, staying with my old man. And they got together and got married and had the family, yeah. But my mum's from a very sporty family as well. Um, I'd have to say that uh, uh, mum's older brother, he played rugby league for New Zealand, played 48 games for the Kiwis, played about the same amount of tests, about 24 tests I think he played. And uh, he was a big man. When I first met him, man, he was huge. And uh, as a tall, he was about six foot six, something like that. And then um, his two younger brothers, they actually had, uh, they both all back trials. They played for Otago with... Uh, the likes of Earl Curtin, uh, Laurie Maines, those sort of people. And they were, one was a big lock and one was a front row forward. And uh, then, then, then after that, that, the next level is all my cousins. And I played against a couple of, a lot, a lot of my cousins down there. And some of the boys that actually married my cousins. Yeah, so um, it's quite interesting every time I go. So every time we go down to South Island, they say, oh, we know you. You're from the Shelford family, eh? You know, <laughs> the only Marys in the family. So, um, yeah, both sporting families, and I suppose it was only about probably 15, 15 years ago, maybe, yeah, 15 years ago, 20 possibly, that my mother and my, see, my mum's in her mid-80s now as well, and uh, she was in a Jill and Jill um, uh, soar, soaring race at one of the gala days down at Wutheru. So at the age of uh, 65, 70, she was still soaring, she was soaring yeah. Mind you, I had to chop all the wood when I was young, you know. Um, so, so sports has been in the family. All of us were sporty, all the kids. Uh, I've got, uh, there's four of us boys and my oldest sibling is a girl and uh, Karen. And uh, so uh, we all played sport. And uh, my sister gave sport away when she got older because uh, she, uh, she had a life. She was bringing up her own kids and lots of stuff. And, but... Um, uh, she just walks now and does her thing in the forest and goes walking and riding on a bike and all that sort of jazz. Uh, brother Dean, he joined the Navy just after me. And um, I, I believe he was good enough to become an All Black, but uh, he married probably the wrong person. <laughs> but I think that once he actually got married, he, he cut back on the, um, on the rugby and uh, just put it into marriage and work, really, more than anything else. And then got Daryl after him. He actually played for Bay of Plenty. And I think he played about 70-odd games for Bay of Plenty. Uh, played with the guy like of Vern Cotter, Frank Shelford, those guys. Uh, he had an all-black trial in 89 and then basically missed out. So he went to rugby league for the next six years and went over and played Bradford Bulls. And, and then, uh, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah, Bradford Bulls. And he went on their coaching staff for another six years. And I finally got him to come and do some coaching with me uh, while I was in London. We had a, and our baby brother, uh, Brett, he passed away only last year. Uh, he was at age 50, 50 years old. Yeah, it was quite sad. But uh, notwithstanding that, very sporting family, yeah. Excellent. Hey, you were touching on the Navy uh, before, Wayne. So you moved up to Auckland 
at the age of 17 to, to join the Navy, the Navy, sorry. Uh, what attracted you to join the Navy at such a young age? And what did they install in you to become the person you are today? We, we hear a lot of things with the armed services, loyalty, respect, attitude, things like that. Yeah, well, I think that the Navy, I, I try and encourage a lot of younger people to go in because you learn things you don't learn under your parents. And so the thing is, I, I always believe that the day you become a leader is the day you actually cut the umbilical cord from your parents. And then you've got to stand up and make decisions for yourself. And they've got to be good decisions, you know, if you want to get on in life. They're poor decisions, you'll end up in a slammer sort of thing, you know, and uh, get caught up in the bad side of the world. But uh, notwithstanding that, um, I went in there. Was it to get away from Rotorua? I think so. You know, I wasn't that great at school. Um, I'm like a lot of us, left fairly early and at 17 and uh, decided let's do something totally different. It was a toss up between the Navy or the New Zealand police. So I decided to go to the Navy because they offered travel. And uh, basically by the time I was uh, 20, I'd been all the way around the world, you know, and uh, travel a lot on the ships and uh, on, the, on the planes, going to football tournaments in Fiji and in Australia, those sort of things. So, um, yeah, it was a very exciting, it's an exciting life for young men until they really decide what they want to do. And uh, so I was in there for 11 and a half years. My first five years, I was gunnery. So I was part of the gunners branch and a seaman. And then I changed over to phys ed teacher for my last six years. And so I done phys ed. So when, as soon as I got back off my course, straight into taking the new recruits and smashing the hell out of them. <laughs> old school, old school, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's the one. So you played for Auckland and then for North Harbour. And in 1985, you were named for the All Blacks for the very first time. What do you remember most about your first ever game in the All Blacks jersey? Uh, it was meant to be against the Springboks, but it was against Argentinian club Atletico San Estrio in Buenos Aires. Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was a great honour to put the jersey on for the first time. And, um, you know, you're a little bit tentative, but, you know, I was 27 when I, I got picked and uh, when I got back to New Zealand, you know, just after I got back, I turned 28. So I was a bit older than some of the other guys. Um, and uh, so when you're younger and you become an all black, you, it's all in awe. But I just took it in my stride, you know, it's just another game of rugby. And so as I played a lot of rugby up to there, I've been playing, you know, Auckland. I played for Auckland for three seasons before we went to, went to North Harbour. And then before that, two years for the Bees. You know, Auckland Bees and under 21s and all that sort of jazz went right through the 10 years. And uh, and I think that really the, the form of 1980, 1984 for Auckland was a big year for us. We won the championship. And uh, I think I got picked off the back of that season more than the season we had with North Harbour. But making it as an All Black is a huge one. And uh, disappointment in not going to South Africa because that was one of the dreams that, that I had as a young guy, is always to go to South Africa and play rugby there. And that was taken away from us. So going to Argentina was good. You know, you still played for the All Blacks, but, you know, they weren't up in the tier where, where you're playing against the elite of world rugby. In South Africa, England, those sort of countries, France, they were the more the elite back in those days. And uh, it's a wonderful experience. And uh, I'll never forget the, the day I was actually picked for the All Blacks because my son was actually born uh, two days beforehand. Eruera Tamati Shelford. Um, and so uh, he was born two days before that. So it was a big, you know, played on the, uh, went home to see my, uh, catch up with my son. And then when he was, uh, I went back on to uh, catch up with the team, played the game. They got picked for the All Blacks and they said I could go home because we, we were going, getting ready to go to South Africa, but then it got cancelled. But notwithstanding that, it was a, it was a, great, uh, a great time in my life, you know, just getting picked for the All Blacks because, um, I remember back to when I joined the Navy in 85 and 86 pre-season training. Uh, I wasn't allowed to play prem rugby in those days because I was still in training. So I actually, um, we just played sixth grade rugby and we're only, we're only 17 year olds, played under 18s basically. And uh, the next year, um, my, my mate and I, we we're both pretty good rugby players and he actually kept in North Auckland for a long a period of time as well, played two, six, seven, and eight, and that was Willie Phillips. We joined the Navy together, and uh, he was a bloody good footballer, very good footballer. And he never really got an opportunity, but notwithstanding it, I did. And, um, and, and so the thing is, 
we both played for the Navy that year, so we went down for a trial. Trials down in um, down in uh, oh, King Country, and we played against one of the clubs down there. And uh, this old fella come up to me after the game in the changing shed. He said, "Are you Buck Shelf?" And I said, "Yes, sir." And uh, you know, very very you know military orientated by this stage. And he said, "Well, keep up the good work. You're going to be an All Black one day." And it was Colin Meads, you know. Oh, oh. And I'd never met an All Black before. <laughs> So basically, I'd never met an All Black until I come to Auckland, and so the thing is, so he was the first All Black I ever met. I hadn't even met all the bad, plenty of All Blacks, you know. There weren't very many of them back in those days. Uh, Graham Crossman, I think, a couple of others, but there were a lot of Māori All Blacks uh, at our in, in our area. So we got to meet them when, as youngsters. But uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things. It's quite interesting, eh? Hey, you know. But notwithstanding that, it was just a privilege to actually be picked for New Zealand. Awesome. Hey, before 1985, the haka was only performed overseas, and it was performed poorly. You and Hicka Reed were instrumental in revitalising the All Blacks haka. Can you talk us through the process of how you did all this? Well, Hicka was the one who was approached first, and he came and saw me. And we sat down. We went to school together, you see. And... Uh, and he said, oh, you know, we should do this. We should do this. No, 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 no. no. Well, let's not just do this thing. We actually do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it properly. And we have to get everyone behind us, management, as well as the whole team. Because we had some old fellas in that team that I knew that didn't like doing it, you know. And so unless we all do it, we're not going to do it. Because we don't want to embarrass, embarrass our, um, our people back home, you know. Mm. Because, you know, you've got all these... All these things, you know, and I say white boys can't dance, all blacks can't dance, bro, you know. And uh, especially those white boys, some of them are bloody terrible. I saw them in the nightclubs years later, you know. And um, so we said, we've got to train for it and spend extra time doing it and getting your, your, your vocab right and all those sorts of things. And um, they bought into it really well. Some of the older ones didn't like, quite like doing it, but they, they you know, they actually come, come to the party in the end. And uh, we started doing it, and then it just carried on from there and snowballed. And as as that old brigade were leaving the team, because in 80, 86, you know, some of them probably came back for their swan song to go to South because uh, the South African trip was actually cancelled. They had brought on this uh, South African team that you know that we went over as the Cavaliers, and they came out of the woodwork. Some of them probably would have retired that year. But they didn't. They stayed on for that Cavaliers tour, and um, and after then they actually all bowed out gracefully and went away. And uh, all the next level of people that come through the All Blacks just, oh, they couldn't wait to do the Haka, the Haka right. You know, they were outstanding. They loved it, and everyone loved doing it. And uh, that's the great thing about it. Uh, it's trying to talk to talk to people because I was I didn't know anything about Kapa Haka until I joined the Navy, and uh, whereas Hicker grew up with it around the mountain, around the back, around the Mata. And we never grew up with it on our side. And, um, and, and sort of thing is, um, I didn't pick it up until I got into the Navy as a 17-year-old. But then, oh, we're still going down to Kapahaka practice now. And I'm nearly, I'm over 60 now. <laughs> so we go down there to the total with them. We don't do all the songs, but uh, we're supporting them as much as we can. And uh, the Navy have their own Kapahaka as well. Oh, we went into two, uh, you know, two uh, regional tournaments up here in Auckland. It didn't do that that well, but we're there, you know. That's and tough. so then it was, but it was all about learning and doing something different because everywhere a ship went, they always expected the Kapa Haka to actually front up at uh, the New Zealand Embassy to go uh, to entertain a uh, a party of people, all that sort of stuff, you know, which is pretty good. And it gave you an extra few hours out and being able to get a few uh, tots into you and a few beers. That's for sure. Yeah. Hey, in 1986, you were named in the controversial Cavaliers team, which you mentioned before, to tour South Africa during the apartheid era. Your decision to play for the team eventually uh, ended your Navy career and you were suspended for two games alongside uh, the rest of the team when you returned home. With everything going on in the world at that time, why did you decide to go on the tour? What was your thinking around all of that? Well, one of the big things as a young lad growing up, and a lot of New Zealanders back in my day, the epitome of world rugby was All Blacks versus South Africa. And so the thing is, when I got picked to become an All Black, I went, wow, this is my chance to actually play against the best in the world. And that was taken away from me, through the courts. 
And so I decided to leave. Um, I didn't, well, if, if the tour would have gone ahead in 85, I would have had permission to go. I had permission to go. But then in 80, 86, when these rebel tour came about, they said no. So I wanted to play in South Africa and was taken away. So I thought to myself, the only way I'm doing it is by going out, leaving, you know. So I left on my own accord. And uh, basically, uh, <laughs> I came back, you know, I think it was about four months later. And they said, I've got your, my boss said, I've got your leave chit in here. As soon as you come back in, we'll rip it up and throw it away, you know, sort of thing is looking after me. And um, so I, I lost that leave chit when I went outside. And they basically said, oh, we, we, we can't employ you because you're, we've actually got too many people in our branch, which I knew, to, which was a load of hogwash because then no one joined the branch since I left. And it was only three, four months later, you know? So then I, I put him to join the army and I was walking out my door at my home and, uh, and the phone rang and I decided I'd better go back and, and answer that. And it was the army ringing up and saying, sorry, Buck, uh, we've just had a call from Wellington. We can't employ you. So I went pretty high up in the politics world and the army wanted to use me as a, as a basically, um, a role of um, for the you young guys bringing in the you new you new young guys and going out there on the road with the uh, the people who uh, do all that sort of work and just just uh, selling the army and army to the to New Zealand yeah rather than work in the, in the gym and just stay in the gym all my life you know so um, I decided uh, after that I uh, let's do something different and uh, after that year uh, Steve McDowell and I went to France and played rugby in France, and I never looked back after that, and so we went from France, two seasons, to England for another three seasons, uh, Italy for another two seasons, and, and so the thing is, because we were really enjoying it. And you know, you're getting paid uh, money, you know, uh, but for working for the clubs, well, because it's amateur in those days, so we're working for the clubs and getting paid, but, uh, you know, leaving the Navy was, was, a, was my, my own choice to leave. But it was their choice not to employ me again, you see. And so the thing is, which was quite sad because uh, everyone in the Navy just could not believe they wouldn't have me back in there. And be, being a current number eight or, you know, for the All Blacks, I would have been in the All Blacks the rest of my, you know, rest of, uh, for the next uh, three or four years until I left in regards to, uh, you know, go, go playing overseas. Because professionalism was just starting to come into its fore in the... Uh, I'd have to say into the four in the late 80s. And Andy Hayden was one of the guys who were leading that big time, especially for all the guys who lost a lot of money while they were actually going on the tours. Because we'd go on three month tours. It's a long way to be away from home from your business when you're paying somebody else and you're not making anything for your family. Yeah, so, so it had to come and it finally came in 1992 was the first All Black tour where they got paid good money. Yeah. So in 1986, you eventually made your test debut for the All Blacks against France, but it was the second test against France in ninth that would go down in rugby folklore. Can you share some of your painful experiences from that game that gave <laughs> you the title of the toughest rugby player ever? Well, I don't think it's about... You know, toughness is not about, you know, fighting, things like that. It's, a, it's about playing hard, playing fair, but when you play against the French... Sometimes they play hard, but they're, sometimes it's, it's dirty as well. And so, you know, um, there's lots of little things. And, and uh, just that particular game, it was quite different to the first game in France and uh, down in Toulouse, whereas we were right on top of them right from the get-go. And then by the time we got to the second test a week later, you know, we picked up a few injuries, so it added to the injury list anyway. And I would have to say that uh, that squad of 21 probably of the 21 there was probably around about 10 guys that were injured anyway that basically played and were on the bench that's how tough it is touring France because you know you get set up you don't actually play club sides you're actually playing uh, combination sides all over France even though they under the name of Beer Ritz they bring in a few guys who are looking for you know like the, the coaches are looking to trial people out so they put these other guys in there to play them and invitation teams and world, you know, world teams, all that sort of stuff to try and get combinations going against the All Blacks with all the guys that they've got who they are looking at. 
and it's a tough way of touring uh, when they do that. But uh, getting back to the game and not, uh, the very next week when we come out of the changing rooms and I just looked into the eyes of everyone that we were standing in front of, facing them, and there's no way that they'll be drinking water that day. They had to be on something. You could see it in their eyes. Mm. It's not very often you go out in a game and you see the pupils of everyone, you know. Uh, the whites of the eyes are, are different. They're red, all that sort of stuff, but not just one person, most of them in the team. Mm. And it come out. You know, years later, you know, I think about a couple of years, two year, two to three years ago, come out in the papers that there was um, finally come out that the, the French were on drugs during the eighties, all that sort of stuff. So uh, my theories back then was were very correct. I even found that out from my own in France when I was in France playing in France. I found it out from my own director, president, that they were on drugs. You know, so. So that particular game there, you know, got knocked out. I think the concussion was the worst, uh, irrespective of being um, uh, getting a few teeth kicked out uh, of the face and then getting the old uh, testicles ripped up. Uh, the concussion was probably the most lingering of all of them, of all the injuries. So downstairs was all right. That came right. Just 16 stitches to put all back together, cleaned it up, tied it up, and still working, all that sort of stuff. And... Um, yeah, but the concussion probably lasted for about three months, four months of getting headaches and, you know, not being able to run because the headaches have come back again. So, you know, right now in this, this world we're living in, the, uh, the head HAI, is that called? Mm. Or HIA, head injury assessment that they're doing now, I think is a fantastic because we never had anything like that back in our day. And when I did get knocked out, Jock wouldn't let me leave, leave the field. And uh, he was the captain, and he wouldn't let me leave the field. No, nah, you can't. We've got no one else on the bench. So those are the sort of things that are changing. And just by having a few, act, you know, that, that, that game itself was probably the most brutal game I've ever played in. Wow. And, you know, that's how filthy it was. Not, I wasn't the only one bleeding. There was lots of other guys bleeding as well. And it's just, it's just the way they played their game that day. And, uh, but, you know, off the field, they're great guys. <laughs> But on the field, they morph into something quite different, you know. <laughs> and the desire to actually, the desire to beat All Blacks is huge, mm. huge from back in those days. The perspective of the French back in those days, England, Wales, Ireland, to beat the All, All Blacks was the epitome of, of being at the top of world rugby, you know. And uh, they look at the, you know, it's, it's, it's just synonymous that this, this brand that we wear in New Zealand Everyone around the world knows that brand before they know a lot of other things. They know who the All Blacks are. They know where they come from. But how does a country of only four and a half million or five million people now, how can they be so good at this one little game that's not even around the whole of the world, you know? It's only in probably about well, 28 major countries in the world, really. But notwithstanding that, that, that game there was a big learning curve for, I think, a lot of people. But it, the one thing I got out of that, that particular game, when it come to the World Cup team in 87, and that Tour de South Africa, man, you know, we, that tour, sorry, yeah, the tour, to South, uh, the tour to South Africa, after we had beaten up by the box of three tests out of four, and then losing that test at the end of the year, man, did we have motivation to actually, to play in that World Cup and win it for this, our country. But notwithstanding, the motivation we, we we lost, you know, I believe we lost a little bit of mana uh, from that game of, in France. But in South Africa, all our young All Blacks toughened up big time. You know, I've been talking about myself, but uh, I'm not young in age when I went there, but I was young in being an All Black. You see? Yeah. Yeah, young All Black, one tour under my belt, a few, a couple of games on tour, and, and then basically... Then we actually go to France a year later and do the same thing again. But the middle of the year, we only had that uh, that internal tour to um, with the Cavaliers. But man, it grew a lot of boys in that, that tour. So fast and it forward, hardened them up mentally, you know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So fast forward a year, uh, and you play France again in the in the nineteen eighty seven Rugby World Cup final. So how sweet was it to beat the French after suffering all of that pain? Uh, in 86, in that record. Well, I have to say, you know, um, when you've been in a tournament for six weeks 
how much training do you need? You know, it's all upstairs in the head for the, you know, for the players. And, and I, we, we actually played in, uh, in Brisbane the weekend before we played on a Sunday, we flew back on a Monday. We had a light training run on the Tuesday split session on the Wednesday. I think it was a light training run on the very light. So very, not, not a lot of training went on. Because even even Brian Lahore and Grizz and John Hart realise, you know, you go through the tournament, you've posted very good scores against most of the teams, and so think, how much do these guys actually have to do the week before a big final? And put it down to, do we need motivation? Hell no. You know, everyone walked out of that field and they just knew, knew exactly what they had to do. You know, six weeks of training together, uh, we knew what we had to do. Um, and one one of the big things was we talked about was winning back the money we lost to France in the in that game, winning back that, winning the cup because we actually split New Zealand when the Cavaliers went 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 overseas. We split New Zealand in half. We lost we lost a lot of people to the game, and it was bringing New Zealand back together as well. So some nice motivating factors there for the team, but for also for the country, and to bring us back together. And so from 87 right through to the next World Cup, the team went unbeaten. So, it was, you know, it was just a privilege to play in that era. But they knew what they were playing for and um, the All Blacks at that time. And after winning that World Cup, you can't just be a one-day, one-game wonder and win the next game and lose the next couple and win one and lose some. And that's one of the big things that a lot of other teams around the world have, who have won the World Cup, except for us when we don't win it, has been they actually go and lose the next couple of games that they play because they're the world champions and they can't be taken away. But, you know, you lose a bit of money when you actually go out and lose your first or second game after you've won the cup eh? the very next season. So it's all about, it was all about building on the heart of that World Cup team and moving forward for the next four years. We knew there was going to be another World Cup in four years' time. So bring those young guys in and then basically harden them up over the next four years to go forward and be the catalyst for the next World Cup. Yeah. And so in the same year as the World Cup 1987, you led North Harbour to an NPC Division II championship, scoring three tries in the final against Hawke's Bay and gaining promotion to Division I. What was the secret be, be, um, behind North Harbour's rise from Division Three to Division I in the space of only um, three years? Well, we could have actually done it in two years if, if we would have made a couple of tackles, you know? <laughs> We missed a couple of tackles and I was telling a few of the boys, come on, come on, cheat, 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 take them out. You know, all those sort of like little wee things. <laughs> Give away a penalty because I think, uh, oh, who's the, who's the kicker that played fullback for the All Blacks and he, he went to rugby league? Uh, Darryl Halligan. Yeah. Yeah. He was a kicker. He was having a bad day with the kick. And I said, just take them out. Take somebody out and create a penalty so they can't score tries. And if they would have kicked the penalty, well, they still wouldn't have won, you see. But they scored a try and he missed the kick. So we had to wait another year to actually get up there. And, uh, and we were pretty motivated this time. You know, well, we were motivated the last time as well. But um, Hawks Bay were a different kettle of fish to, to, the, um, to the Waikato boys, the Mulu boys. They were pretty tough on their own ground. But uh, going down to Hawks Bay, who'd been down in the second division for quite a long time, uh, I think we just had just, just too much firepower up front for them. And to make it up to the, to the top of the... Uh, premiership back in you know those days there was was awesome and uh, one of the big th things that Pete Thorburn done with us was was not just for the 15th but for the sevens game as well was um, and he was instrumental in, in in that side of things where if we want to grow fast we have to grow by playing against the best and the best were Auckland Wellington going and playing against these teams in the, in the pre seasons you know. And you might get a hiding, you know, one game, but then you learn the lessons pretty quickly. If you want to compete with these big guys, you got to learn, grow, grow fast. And uh, in those first two years, you know, they grow, or three years, they grew pretty quickly, these boys. You know, so I guess some of these guys, there's probably, uh, when we first made North Harbour, there was only two guys, three guys, I think, um, that actually played in the North Harbour team in that first, first couple of games that were Auckland players. It was myself, Gary Cunningham, and Mike Mills, actually, Mike Mills. So there's only three of us, and Brad Johnson was called in as a, like a front row forward to actually help us out, all those sort of things. 
And so, so we only had three top players. By the time we got to the you know first division, and uh, the first division um, in the championship team to play in eighty nine, I think it is. Uh, 85, 86, 87, 89, yeah, 89, we were taking out first division teams, you know, and so it's just, that's the truth. Learning really, really well off the big guys and putting into practice what you learned off them and uh, getting better as a team. Um, and so we were in the top four for the, for the next four years until I actually retired from North Harbour Rugby, which for me, that was fantastic. You know, I, I love that and to help bring a new union uh, come come through was absolutely fantastic. Um, but notwithstanding that, you know, I, I I didn't think about the All Blacks when I changed my mind to go back come come over here to to North Harbour. I didn't even think about the All Blacks. Uh, it wasn't my priority. My priority was was being closer to home. Uh, I worked on the North Shore. I lived on the North Shore. I had babies and so on. So you know, you want to stay where where the family is as much as possible. And I didn't want to cross the bridge every training night and all that sort of stuff. Fair enough. Yeah. In 1988, you captained the Māori All Blacks on an eventful world tour. How much of an honour was it to be a part of the Māori All Blacks environment representing your whānau, hapū and iwi? Yeah, that was, that was very, very good. That was a great tour. One of the greatest tours I've ever been on. And uh, just the camaraderie was good. And, you know, coaching staff, you know, Billy was there and... Uh, uh, Matty Blackburn was our, our coach, you know, all those sorts of things. And, and Billy was on the first tour, and I, went, I, I, went, I, got, I got called in on the 81 tour. Uh, Colin Cooper actually uh, done his hamstring or something like that, or his knee, done his knee. Ends. And I got called over, and man, I saw a lot of things happen on that tour. And I said, if I ever become a Māori All Black on another tour like this, there's no way they're going to get out of this crap, you know? And uh, oh, they were doing all sorts of things that even even a lot of premiership teams would not do that in a tour, you know. Uh, the Māori, you know, once they got a bit of leeway, the man, they were wild. You know, some people were pretty good, but there was, there was always a handful that were always playing up all the time, you know, turning up late and lots of jazz. Even the manager was turning up late. Look, Mr. Walker Nathan, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, sort of thing is, it was, it was, uh, the 81 tour was good, but when, when we went into the, uh, the 88 tour, I sat down with a lot of the senior players and the management and I said, here are a few of the things that I saw that will not happen on this tour. And we've got to keep a tighter ship, very much a more, more of a professional model. We can still play our Māori rugby, but we've got to behave ourselves off the field as well as on the field, you know, all those sorts of things. And uh, it was a great tour. And um, we, 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 lost, we lost one game on that tour. And it was a tough game, but, you know, we scored probably two tries, were disallowed, and then we got a, I think it was a six, nine-point try against us. So they, oh, they scored a try, got the conviction, come back for a penalty and kicked the goal from halfway, you know? <laughs> and so, you know, these are sort of things that that particular game, Picker Reed just couldn't believe it. He'd scored, he scored one of the tries, we went over twice, both disallowed. And so, the thing is, so the referee was really on their side, and no matter what we done, we were never going to beat them, you know. But we had a couple of other games on tour very similar like that. The referees let them get away with murder. But um, it's a tough country to tour, as I said before, you know, very tough country to tour. But you know, how many how many uh, teams would you envisage play a game in Italy, eight games in France, two in Spain, and another one down in? Um, Another one down in Argentina against the top clubs in, in, in the, the unions, you know. So it was actually a tough tour. And even the last game at Tucumán up in uh, Buenos Aires was uh, called off 10 minutes early because of the fighting. Where one guy carried off on a stretcher, you know, just king hit from behind. And, you know, those are the sort of things we were putting up with. And, but, but in the end, when we, when we came off the field in Tucumán, uh, one one of our players got but he stabbed in the in the in the in the side of his leg with a blooming umbrella, and uh, and something is, he collapsed, you know, because of the hit that he took to the knee. Not just us, but they were throwing bottles at us and everything. And so we were in the stadium a long time and waiting for the crowd to disperse to go away. Yeah, pretty wild up there, man. Gee. <laughs> hey, uh, so you talk over you don't, even, you don't even get that down Rotoria, you know. <laughs> 
So I was, I was just saying, you took over as captain after the World Cup until uh, 1990 and did not lose a single game. How would you describe your leadership style, Wayne, and what were some of the standout moments for you as a captain of the team? Well, it's pretty hard to stand out moments. It's hard, pretty hard to pick them when you're actually winning every game, you know, mm-hmm. winning your game by, by comfortable scores. Um, but I think that my, my style is, is still very military orientated. And later on, when I went, to my, went into coaching, that's when I started changing because it was all changing, you know, and it was becoming really PC and all that sort of stuff. So I started changing along those lines as well. And, uh, and so, so being with the All Blacks, you know, uh, there was a lot of good leaders in that team, uh, in, that, in that forward pack and the backs. You know, Joe Stanley and I were the oldest in the, in the All Black team at that time. And we played from under 18s right through the Auckland scene and into the All Blacks as well. And we had a lot of time for each other. And, and uh, basically, we grew up, basically grew up together playing rugby. And, um, you know, having him and some of the other senior players and saying, hey, we, we need to bloody just play our good football, you know, but we've, got to, we've still got to train hard and, and uh, really enjoy ourselves, you know, off the field as well as on the field. And so the thing is, uh, and the last thing you want is uh, people coming and trying to stick bloody knives in the back of other players and all that sort of jazz. So I was always on the, on the, on a little bit wary about some of that sort of stuff that could happen. And uh, there's always people prodding or trying to go further forward within a team, you know. And I should be there, he shouldn't be there, all this sort of stuff goes on in a lot of teams. And uh, I just thought to myself, well, if, if I see it or I hear it or somebody complains about it, but I, I actually, I just about cancelled the back seat at one stage, you know. I warned them all. I said, this, there, this shit going down, you know. And, What's on tour stays on tour, and basically stuff was getting out, and you know sort of thing. And so I didn't know where it was coming from, but it ended up. I went to the back seat. It doesn't stop. You find out. If it doesn't stop. You're going to be shut down. So you know, I didn't muck around with them because I wasn't scared. I wasn't scared of any of them. You know, all that sort of stuff. They might have been in the orbit. It's a bit longer than me. Maybe four years, five years old, longer than me. I didn't give a damn. I was the captain. And I had to lead that way. And sometimes I got a bit tough on them, on the football field. Because um, I knew when they weren't fronting, if we were, we were losing our ball in the line out, I'd give the locks an air barreling. If the front rowers are coming, going backwards on the ball, I'd give Lowy or Drakey a bloody, you know, a what's for. You know, and they'll just have, rah, 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 you know, like front rowers do, and moan and bitch. And then all of a sudden, they win the next five, six scrums in a row, you know. So, um, yeah, on the whole, you know, like Foxy and I used to have a, have a little bit of a thing, and uh, I'd look at him, say, what do you want? And he'd go, b-ball. So he wanted the backs, and I'd turn, nah, I'm having it this time. Because <laughs> so, cause he always wants the ball, you know, half, I mean, fly halves always want the ball, yep. you know? And sort of thing is, the way of mixing up your attack was to be able to, for us, is to go around the back of a line-out, or come back to the front of a line-out, all those sorts of things, uh, and attacking positions, and off scrums especially, you know? And um, uh, if you ever ask him back if he wants the ball, he'll always say, yes, I do. <laughs> you know? So I took that option away from him. He says, I look at you and I'll give you the opportunity. But if I think it's a better play to actually get him on the front foot and get the forwards going forward first rather than be off a set piece, I'd actually take, take, the, take the role and we'll, we'll wind something off the scrum with the Lucies and, and get Michael Jones running and get the big forwards smashing the hell out of the opposition going backwards. And all of a sudden, Fox is on the front foot and the backs are going going and hitting the ball at pace rather than being flat-footed, yeah. So you were, uh, you were sensationally dropped from the All Blacks. Like you said, you went undefeated. And you were dropped from the All Blacks after the 1990 Test Series against Scotland, and you were playing very well in that series. And to this day, there aren't many answers as to why you were dropped. And yeah, I, I, I thought it was later. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so 30 years later, looking back, why do you think that happened Obviously, it brought up bring back buck chance all all across the world. So, what what is well in the well, you know that happened in eighty in nineteen ninety, and there was a huge, it was a huge power struggle between Auckland and Canterbury, and uh, I know for a fact I've talked with Chris about this a few times, and and he he said to me if he could have the he could turn back the clock he wouldn't have dropped me, you know. 
but that's what's that's what he's got to live with, you know. Okay. And so the thing is, I just got on with my life. My, my you know, my wife, you know, just hated what actually happened. But uh, you know, I'm pretty. This is sport, and you just got to get on with your life. Um, I was 34 when it, or 33, 30, going on 34 or something like that. And I thought, man, I've had a bloody pretty good career considering, you know, I haven't had too many injuries. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been able to play at the highest level, captain our country, and we've done really well. So I just moved on, really. But then, you know, I found out through closed doors, uh, sort of through, um, from one of the players in the All Black team of 89, I didn't find this out until about 93, that they were having meet the players were having meetings behind closed doors to get rid of me as a captain. You know, and so you know, people always deny it, but they were all Aucklanders, you know. And so, the thing is, um, so you could possibly write out, you know, half a team <laughs> right then and there. And so, um, he didn't even he, he was asked to go to these meetings, but he actually didn't. This guy didn't actually go to the meetings, he didn't think it was irresponsible of the players, to, irresponsible of the players to do this, you know, because they were. I think they were trying to get Zinni into the number one seat, you know, and get him in there. But it's it's one of those things that, you know, I've got a lot of respect for Zinni. He's a great player. And um, and Auckland you let him allow, allowed him to do a lot of things. But in the All Blacks, he he didn't didn't get that leeway to play the way he wanted to until probably John Hart took over in ninety five, ninety six. Because all the coaches that they had in there, like uh, Trema- uh, Laurie Mains, uh, took uh, took over from Hardy, and he was a. This is what I want out of number eight. You don't do it, you're not playing, sort of thing. And Zinni actually even got demoted to the blind side there for a few, for a, quite a while because um, Aaron Penny got the number eight job, because that's the type of number eight he wanted. It was a go forward number eight off the back of the scrum, carrying the ball hard, you know. Zinni was out in the backs waiting for the catch to ball and run with it all the time, you know, all those sorts of things. Great player, you know, great skillful player. But um, that sort of thing is, you know, there was a little bit of there at, at one stage there. And I have to tell the boys to pull their heads in. And that was against the, in that game in Scotland because they wanted to play like they were playing for Auckland. So I took a couple of them aside and told them to pull their heads in, you know. And then after that game, you know, I was actually dropped. But notwithstanding that, it was that was Grizz's uh, um, job to do, and uh, he was under so much pressure, so much pressure from the NZRU and Canterbury and Auckland to sort it out, and uh, basically he hated doing it, you know. But um, in hindsight, it's always great in hindsight, eh? You know, but. Um, yeah, we've talked about it a bit, and one of the big things that a lot of people don't know is that uh, when he took the All Black coaching job, he wanted Doug Bruce as his first lieutenant, his assistant coach. And the powers to be in Wellington said, no, you will take John Hart. And so you got to look at it now. Basically, your head coach has got the pick of who he wants. Even back in the day, it was a pick of who you want. You could take who you wanted. But that particular time, There was so much going on. You will take John Hart as your co-coach, you see. And so so that went on and and for, you know, there was a lot of niggle in the back, you know, between those ones and all that sort of stuff was going on all the time. And um, we didn't see it, you know, out in the open, but we we heard about certain things that went on, you know. Yeah. So, but notwithstanding that, you know, I just went on and, and uh, started doing my job somewhere else in the world. And it was great meeting new people, you know, different people, different players, different cultures, and enjoying my t- myself with my family. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And um, so years later, so back in 2007, you were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So after six months of intensive chemo, you made a full recovery. How has this experience affected your outlook on life? Yeah, well, it does. It does affect you, um, and uh, you know, I always look at look look at my um, my lifestyle back then, and, and say, you know, what what are the reasons why I actually got like that, and well, I got cancer. And they say stresses can be a cursor to cancer as well, and possibly um, 
2005 and 2006, I was coaching up in Japan and, uh, and I was on the go probably in that time. I was doing probably up to, in that two years, I probably done 20 flights to Japan, there and back. And just flying backwards and forwards all the, you know, uh, you know 10 each year. And, and basically coming backwards and forwards, running the business here in Silverdale at the pub. It was just probably just the stress of the flights and, and working two jobs and organized life up there, trying to keep it going down here as well, all those sorts of things. And um, just probably caught up with me and kicked me in the backside. And uh, I, I was, well, I was probably, I was probably, I got back into shape while I was up in Japan and was out running all the time and in the gym and lots of stuff. And uh, I got my weight down and I was back to my playing weight. But notwithstanding that, I think that I, I was still carrying a little bit of weight, but notwithstanding that, uh, you know, came down, hit, got hit, but at the end of the day, you've got to get on with it and you've got to try and beat the bugger. And you just do what the, do what the doctors tell you. And, uh, and then I, you know, as well as doing, you know, the traditional chemotherapy and all that sort of stuff, I was doing uh, uh, naturopathy as well with a doctor doing rungo Māori as well, so trying to bring in all these extra little things uh, to help me out because for every pill that uh, the white man's doctor give you, you have to have a pill to fix up that pill and then you get another pill to fix up the pill that you've just been given and, you know, you have so many problems, you know, from, the, from what they give you to actually help you get through the cancer and, um, you know, it just makes you feel uncomfortable but it takes you a while to get over it too. A good year for the, the chemo to get out of, out of your body, out of your system as well. So, you know, taking all these drugs to try and get rid of it out of the, out of the system very quickly. But I was standing that, you know, we were back into the throw of things a year later. And um, so 2008, my wife and I went for a uh, bike ride around Devonport and we were going past the rugby club. We just said, hey, rugby club, let's go. We passed the rugby club and the boys were down there. One of my mates was the head coach and he comes up to me and we got there just at the end of training. He comes, hey, bro. I'm looking for another coach. Take the second team. Can you do it? And I looked at my wife and she goes, she rolls her head, you know, the old Mary way, uh, like this. Yeah, I'm in, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in, yeah, coaching uh, 2008. Now, I'm still there now. I'm the president of the club now. Still going oh. to help out with the coaching, you know? Oh, excellent. <clears throat> so it's uh, it's all good, you know. So the thing is, you, you got to get over these things and the, they're not milestones in your life, but they're, they're, they're things that rock you a little bit. And uh, so in 2010, um, so 2008, I was back into coaching again. 2009, I, I brought my daughter back into the business to actually take over because we actually had the place leased out for a little while. And uh, she came in and, and she worked her butt off. And then, and basically, then she came down with cancer as well. So uh, basically, she went through her regime. And uh, we actually, just after she, we, we sold the pub, got out. And that's, that's one of the reasons we sold it, you know, because it was a lot of work doing the pub work and um, especially a small, small pub out, in the, you know, up here in Silverdale. But now, you know, the city's growing up around us. There's probably another 10, 10 15,000 houses in this area over the last 10 years. So, um, yeah, we got out of that business and uh, we just said, let's go and get a normal job or something, you know and just spend more time than joining each other, enjoying our family time with our, our kids and our mukos now. Yeah. It's beautiful, bro. Hey, um, so after your cancer scare, you started learning te reo. Uh, how important is te reo for you and your whanau, and what do you think needs to be done to normalise te reo in everyday New Zealand life? Well, you know, I've been doing te reo for a long time, and, and so thing is it just doesn't stick. Or it does. Some of it sticks with me, you know, but it's learning all the kupu, man. You know, back in my dad's day, I don't think they had this many words did they in Māori. Mm. <laughs> and so the thing is, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't think, I don't think my dad would recognise half the kupu that they have today. And so the thing is, but uh, notwithstanding that, I, I, I do enjoy watching, watching the, um, some of the interviews with our, our Pākeke, eh? you know, that it's really, it's an easy reel to understand compared to some of our youngsters, our young, young men that, that speak at 100 mile an hour and then it's all one word to me. You know, I can't pick out what the words are, some of them, because they speak too fast. But uh, I've enjoyed going to these courses and enjoyed being in, in, in that environment. Um, 
but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying. I'm still trying my best, and uh, I've got to get through this. Once we get out of this COVID thing properly, and we get my business back up working properly, uh, my wife and I will probably get. Oh, she's in it all the time because she does all the Māori and she's at Wānanga here, Wānanga there, all over the place, over the mutu, you know, doing her thing, and she's down with Matai Fitu and uh, in Thames. That's her marae down there. She's down there for Wānanga all the time, you know. And uh, I go down with her, join in down there, and you know, all those little things. And but uh, I, I think for our our bubbers today, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, like my my wife, she just speaks them in the real, and and basically I understand what she's saying. But I find it very hard to articulate it back to her sometimes. Yeah, and and I think that that other part of your question, what do you think? Well. My wife was working in a in a little group called Te Reo Tuatahi, and basically at one stage, at one stage was a couple of years ago now, they were in about thirty three schools on the North Shore, and they, and it was teaching Te Reo to half an hour classes uh, within you know that school you know go from class to class to class for half an hour, and unless the teachers are prepared to sit and learn it as well, you're never going to get it in. Even though it's law, even though it's law. My sister-in-law is a teacher up here on Stanmore Bay, and she says, I've been at this school for eight or nine years, and they still have the same excuses for not teaching that ill, you know? And they haven't grown, and yet they get all this time off, this government pays all this money for them to go and do all these park here courses and they, they have to pay a kayak or somebody to come in to actually take their place, which is for a day, probably about 300 bucks a day. And then they come back in because they've been away for their course. And it's paid for by the government. The government pays the salary for this other person to come in. And yet they can only pay our kayak or only $25 an hour, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And, and so, they go, so they have these teachers going out and doing these courses, but they never implement them implement them into the classroom. Mm. And that's the sad fact of life. You, until we get a lot more teachers speaking at all uh, and teaching it in the school, you're not going get to it, get it through the Parkia system. Kia ora. Yeah. Finally, uh, how did you get the nickname Buck? And what's this about the other nickname that we've heard about? God. We hear front of ah. had a bit to do with that one. God. <laughs> we didn't know that was your other nickname. <laughs> it's a pretty big name. It's a pretty big name to live up to. <laughs> Oh, well, I suppose Buck, I've had that name since I was at uh, primary school intermediate. Yeah. So I had, I was quite skinny in the old, back in the young days and tall and rangy, but uh, I had pretty buck teeth and the body grew out later on. See, the head grew out, the body grew out, everything. I was just bones and back in the days, in the, in the young days, yeah. Just got tall and rangy and uh, moved into the forwards. Uh, I played in the backs. Um, Right up until high school. Your first five, eh? Was it? Yeah, first five, okay. yeah. And then I went into the forwards and because I was tall. Uh, I was, oh, what I was? I left high school, I was six foot. I wasn't that tall, but, you know, I played lock most of high school. And I changed to number eight when I actually come and went into the Navy. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, the God name, that was given to me by the North Harbour boys. <laughs> <laughs> Because I was like a slave driver to those. Because <laughs> 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 I, I, you know, even though Frano become a, an All Black, we had a couple of other All Blacks in the team as well. I drove them, you know, and so and then the two of us, and they turned around and they'd walk away from yes God, yes God, you know, <laughs> and, and and it stuck. A lot of people still say that, but um, not so much now because you know the North Harbour boys have gone, you know. But they always, when we're together, they still, they always say, oh, God's coming, or something like that, you know? Yeah, because I used to have a, like a set of reins on a couple of guys, you know? Because they were the ones who always used to play up. <laughs> always used to play up, yeah. Hey, but, yeah. you know, rug, the rugby, you know, in, in, in essence of, of my career, just I enjoyed, enjoyed being with all the players, and, you know, especially after, after the game. Playing the game was, was great too. Winning the games and losing games together, but it's getting to know people and that, you know, right, the wide range of people within your community. And like now, I, I've been to see my accountant today. He's a rugby player. I played against him. You know, my lawyer's a rugby player. We, I played against, you know. And so you use all those 
those contacts in your in your area that you have been for the last 25, 30, 40 years. You use these people because they've they've grown up with you. You're all the same age. You're all in business, so you might as well look after their business. They'll look after your business, you know. And you tend to look after each other all the way through, and it's a, it's a lifetime thing, I believe. Right. That um, I go back home to see mates down there. There's no one there anymore, you know. They're all gone, gone somewhere else. I don't know where they're gone, but man, they've all disappeared. <laughs> yeah. And when you're heading into your when you're in your sixties, you know your mates are starting to pop off everywhere. You know, some of them are in their fifties, some of them are in their seventies, and they're all starting to pop off and. And, uh, you know, that's why looking after yourself is a big thing, you know, especially when you get in, getting close to retirement years. Um, you know, when, it, when you're actually in your, probably in your 50s, I suppose, it's a little bit harder to shoot to actually uh, shift the, mid, the midriff if you've packed on a bit of weight over the years. So it's about trying to look after yourself as much as you can once you finish playing sport because that's when you start packing on the weight because you're not doing any of the running anymore and you're eating too much and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. A, um, I know that's all been good, you know. Had a great life, had a great career. Excellent. Hey, and we really appreciate um, opening up on some of these amazing stories over uh, your career in this uh, podcast, uh, Buck. Hey, listen, but before we go, we've got a challenge for you, and it's called Pick Up the Pace Challenge. We do it every week with the guests. So basically, we ask one topic. So it might be name different currencies of the world. So it might be New Zealand dollar, the Vietnam dong, the Thai baht, things like that. So you've got to name nine answers to this one topic in 10 seconds. <laughs> you gotta you gotta you gotta be quick. You got your um time with the artery? You can <coughs> use this one if you want. Yeah, there we go. It's the your explosive speed off the back of the scrum there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like... Well you don't pass it the foxy, you take off to the uh, to the right. <laughs> Alrighty. Here we go. Wayne Buck Shelford from Rotorua. Name for me in ten seconds, nine things, anything found in a bathroom. Go. Bathroom, toothpaste, soap. Flannel, uh, toilet, paripaku, shower, uh, a window, um, towels, heater, lights. Hey. That's ten seconds. No, I, 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 if we if we went back and watched it, I think I think you got it on the nine. Oh, photo finish. Yeah, it's a photo finish. Let's have a look. I think you put you got it. You did get it. <laughs> you got well, that. You, oh, you Things we talk about it's everything on the walls, windows no. on the wall. <laughs> That's the thing, right? So it's actually easier than what you think because Arudu was saying. Um, you know, shower and bath. Okay, but that's not a thing in the bath. Like, yeah, it you, is a thing. Well, you put a thing it, in the, yeah, 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 it is. That's right. That's right. That's why we put anything. <laughs> well, true to form, uh, Wayne Buck Shelford undefeated. <laughs> you get another one, yeah. so we'll we'll give that one to you. Um, Ngāmahi nui kia koe te rangatira o te ao uh, Māori, o te ao Whitupōro, o Aotearoa, o te ao hoki. Um, thank you very much for joining us on our Pick Up The Pace podcast, and you take care and um, all the best to you and your whanau. Thank you, uh, Kuru. Uh, Great being on the show. Great being on the show. And when I come down to when I come back down, when I come down to Welland, I'll give you guys a call. I'll come out and uh, meet yes. your meet your uh, grandfather. <laughs> yes. yes. Kia ora, kia ora. Yeah. That'll be good. Let's okay. Thank you. Kia ora. Kia ora.